So here we come to the second essay of the week, uh, Richard T. DeGeorge, Ethical Responsibilities of Engineers in Large Organizations, the Pinto case, uh, which is an infamous uh, case of, uh, from the 1970s. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with it. Uh, it seems that in engineering ethics, uh, there are two uh, standard um, uh, cases uh, that, that everyone talks about. The, the Pinto case from the 1970s and then the Challenger disaster from the uh, 1980s. These uh, cautionary tales of what can go terribly, terribly wrong uh, raise all these ethical issues. But, um, you know, the DeGeorge, this is a very interesting essay, and, and I would imagine that uh, for many of you who will ultimately work for large corporations, many of you already have. I have a number of students from last quarter and this current quarter, for instance, who worked for Boeing, uh, which is involved currently in its own uh, problems that, to me, raise ethical issues. And I hope that you look at the links that I put in the um, engineering ethics in the news section of the website uh, to take a look at that, educate yourself about that, that many of you will uh, work for large corporations. and. Uh, this would seem to be uh, particularly uh, relevant. And now, of course, this is just one person. This person has no abs no real authority. This is simply uh, some ideas which are being argued for, and sort of the strength of the arguments that support the idea. This person has no actual um, authority. Uh, obviously, they're just putting out their ideas. Uh, however, um, you know, extremely interesting, and I would imagine pretty controversial. And again, very difficult to read this. Uh, without taking into consideration what's happening in our book, uh, Hold Paramount, and Chris's uh, ethical problem in chapters four and five, and whether this engineer, Chris, has actually done his or her duty uh, sufficiently. Uh, the, the, the question uh, that arises from the Kipnis essay, the last essay, uh, Engineers Who Kill, was whether, whether for me, was whether non-participation, refusal to participate, in what one considered to be uh, a, a, what amounts to an unethical project is uh, sufficient or whether one needed to do more, as Chris explores, that really, really raises the question of whistleblowing. Um, that is, um, if we take Chris's example, and it's clear that the authors of Hold Paramount, when they were writing chapters four and five, had read and had DeGeorge's essay in mind. They mentioned DeGeorge by name. Uh, they talk about his criteria for whistleblowing. Uh, they use some of his language. For instance, you'll see the uh, expression moral hero in Chapter 5 of Hope Paramount, where Chris decides, in the words of the authors, not to be a moral hero and blow the whistle. That language is taken. Uh, I'm not saying DeGeorge coined that term, moral hero, by any means, but that seems to be obvious reference to DeGeorge, uh, who uses that language, too. He mentions in the very opening of this essay the myth of the engineer as moral hero, which he means to dispel that myth. But it's difficult not to think of Chris's situation and, and with regard to what DeGeorge says in this essay. One of the things that I, I would like to point out is that uh, Chris does not work for a large corporation. Chris works for a, what would seem to me a, a rather small company. Um, certainly the you know, he doesn't work for Boeing or Ford uh, or, you know, Bechtel or some huge, you know, multinational publicly traded monster <laughs> like that. So whether that has some impact or not uh, on the ethics of what Chris decides, I'm not entirely sure, but it seems to me that the, the kind of situation that that George has in mind is, of course, you know, the case that he decides to talk about or apply his ideas to, and it's a Pinto case, where you have Ford Motor Company, it's a huge company, you know, a huge, powerful company, and, and to be a to be one engineer in such a company is not to have a huge amount of, of influence or power, I would imagine. You know, a typical engineer at Ford, automotive engineer, is not going to be super powerful within the corporation, I think that's a lot, you know, that, 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 that fact influences to a large degree, I think, reading this essay to George's um, ideas. Uh, you know, what is this essay about? Well, you know, it's very readable. I don't need to say that much about it, but it's clear that DeGeorge thinks that whistleblowing, 
uh, would constitute a form of moral heroism, and then it's unreasonable to hold uh, engineers to that sort of standard. Uh, he says again in the opening paragraph, after saying that he, you know, is against the myth of the engineer's moral hero, he says we cannot reasonably expect engineers to be willing to sacrifice their jobs each day for principle and to have a whistle ever by their side ready to blow if their firm strays from what they perceive what they perceive to be the morally right course of action. That may be putting it a little bit strongly, but you can see the way he's going. He doesn't believe that it's reasonable to ask engineers to be constantly on the lookout for unethical behavior on the part of their companies or within their companies and to be obligated to report all such behavior. In fact, he doesn't think that that's part of the engineering duty or profession at all, uh, at, at least if you are working for a large corporation as a mere employee. He spends a lot of time, this is a really fascinating account of the, the Pinto case, and I think you should read it carefully. Um, you know, this was a legal case. This was, a, you know, the government actually brought Ford Motor Company to court sort of a, in this sort of, is a corporation a person thing? No, Mitt, Mitt Romney thinks so. And so uh, apparently the, you know, the federal prosecutor, I think it was the federal prosecutor, uh, thought so too, and actually brought Ford Motor Company to court on criminal charges. Um, but a very interesting assessment of this case. It is not really clear cut. Uh, obviously, this is a disastrous car. I mean, it killed, did kill people. Um, you know, and it no doubt almost destroyed the reputation of Ford Motor Company uh, and was a terrible car, the Pinto, uh, in, in, in terms of safety. It's ridiculous. Now, it's a much more complex thing than that when it comes to legal liability. I mean, how did it compare to other subcompact cars and you know, cars in the same category? Um, you know, uh, did it uh, was the state of the art? Uh, were, were, you know, wh how what was the development of this, uh, this rear mounted gas tank? Uh, you know, how was it done? You know, kind of inconclusive actually. But deciding whether or not Ford was at fault or criminally liable for the death for deaths of these poor people who were rear-ended uh, and unnecessarily died, there's no doubt about that, right? But that's not really the issue here. The issue is 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 what whether the the engineers involved at Ford uh, did uh, what they should, whether they acted ethically uh, after giving an account, a very good account, I think, of the Ford case um, on page four, in the middle of the page, he says, "Given these facts, what are we what are we to say about the Ford engineers? Which is, after all, what we're interested in. Where?" were they when all this was going on, and what is their responsibility for the Pinto? The answer, I suggest, is that they were where they were supposed to be doing what they were supposed to be doing. Uh, they were performing tests, designing the Pinto, making reports. But do they have no re moral responsibility for the products they design? What, after all, is the moral responsibility of engineers in a large corporation? And he goes on to ask the question. I mean, there were, there were engineering, there were concerns on the part of some engineers that this was just not good. This was not safe, the way that they mounted this, uh, this gas tank, and they proposed changes that would make it more safe. And, and, and George says, you know, that's, that's they were doing their job. You know, that's what their job is, to design things that, um, that work, that are profitable, and that are as safe uh, as they can be, or at least to come up to the industry standard or the state of the art in terms of what's possible in a practical sense, I mean, he, you know, he admits that, you know, a, a luxury car, a much more costly car can be, you know, it's going to be more safe than a, uh, a compact, a cheaper car, uh, but that that's part of the deal, you know, in terms of the, um, you know, the, the cost, and so it's not in itself something unethical for Ford Pinto does not rise to the level of safety of a BMW or something. I don't know about that. You know, frankly, I don't know about that because I would seem to say that rich people, you know, have to, they, they deserve more safety than poor people. But uh, maybe that's a bigger issue that we can't ask the George to, to, to deal with. But in any case, I mean, it's very interesting then what he says. I mean, about the Ford engineers. I mean, uh, should they have done more than they did? And his answer is basically no. Why? Because that's not their job. 
that, that is, it's not their job to what? It's not their job to second guess managerial decisions. And it's not their job to determine uh, safety levels. That's the job of the management of the, of the corporation and of the state and federal government, lo lo state and local governments and federal government to determine those things, especially federal government, obviously. Um, that, you know, the big issues of, you know, how safe something should be, uh, cost-benefit analysis, uh, what is an acceptable level of risk, how much value, money value, we can put on a human life in terms of justifying putting a human life at risk. These are all big questions that need to be decided, but they need to be decided by other uh, categories of uh, society, by, again, the management of the company and by the government and ultimately by the people. That the engineer can't take that much on. That is, it's, it's simply not fair, and engineers aren't qualified to do things anyway. And engineers are qualified to, to build stuff, to implement technologies, to assess levels of safety, to advise the owners of the company uh, of levels of safety, to inform them, maybe even to you know to try to urge them to do things, but not ultimately to make these sort of decisions. Um, for instance, what he says on the bottom of page five: engineers and large firms have an ethical responsibility to do their jobs as best they can, to report their observations about safety and improvement of safety to management, but they do not have the obligation to insist that their perceptions or their standards be accepted. They're not paid to do that. They're not expected to do that, and they have no moral or ethical obligation to do that. It's pretty strong stuff, and that would seem, you know, man, that would seem to kind of let old Chris off the hook. Maybe. Uh, but that's not to say that uh, engineers can't and maybe shouldn't sometimes, if they cannot get satisfaction of their concerns within the company, go outside the company. Uh, he says, for instance, on top page six, at the same time, engineers are required by their professional ethical codes, codes to hold the safety of the public paramount, to put it first. Where these obligations conflict, that is the obligation of loyalty to the employer and um, to hold paramount the safety of the public, the need for and justification of whistleblowing arises. Uh, if we admit the obligation, obligations on both sides, I would suggest, as a rule of thumb, that engineers and other workers in a large corporation are morally permitted to go public with information about the safety of a product if the following conditions are met. And then he gives various conditions for when it is morally permissible to blow the whistle. That is, to go outside the company to a media, uh, engineering society, to government, and make one's concerns known, get the information out there, when it is permissible to do so. And uh, gives three conditions. And then gives uh, two additional conditions, four and five, farther down the page. And, and this is where the engineer might have an obligation to do so. That is, the, the, the first three conditions would be conditions for when it is permissible. And that would, I guess, be a matter of choice on the part of the engineer. That is, if you want to blow the whistle, you have to make sure that these three things uh, are, uh, are sort of ticked off. Uh, and you can read them for yourself on page six, of course. Uh, conditions four and five are what would make whistleblowing morally obligatory. Uh, condition four, he must have documented evidence that would convince a reasonable and partial observer that his view of the situation is correct and the company policy wrong. That is, there has to be objective evidence and number five, there must be strong evidence that making the information public will, in fact, prevent a threat and serious harm. It may be that, you know, bringing this to the public will, will not actually do that. Very, very interesting, I think. Uh, you know, the, the, al although, you know, of course, that allows for the not only permissibility, but the maybe in some cases the obligation to blow the whistle. The, the thrust of this essay is really to put the onus of public safety on the corporations and on the government. And uh, what, what DeGeorge seems to be saying is that engineers should not be put in that position in the first place. And, and that's a matter of changing the large institutions of government and corporations uh, rather than putting the onus on individual engineers and their ethical duties. <coughs> 